We're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to get all the copper and critical minerals that are needed to do the electrification that we were just talking about on the previous panel. Uh, my guests for that are Eugene Lay, who is the Chief Financial Officer of HUD Bay, Copper Gold Company, Canadian, Stuart McDonald, the CEO of Taseco Mines, and Cashel Marr, who is the President and COO of Capstone Copper. Please welcome them all to the stage. And I'll remind everyone, if you have questions for anyone on the panel, please send them in. I've got an iPad here, and I am checking it. But uh, thank you all for, for joining us. I hope you heard a little bit of the last session. So obviously, there's a, a need, a desperate need, for a lot of the stuff that you guys are getting out of the ground. Um, the topic today is how to build a mine. And I was thinking that this week, it would have been really perfect to have said, like, how to keep a mine, given all of the news that, that we've been facing. And I've got to start there. I'm going to ask you, first of all, Stuart, um, what kind of fallout, if any, do you see happening, like, not just for those who are already producing a mine, but all the way through the ecosystem as a result of the first quantum news this week? Yeah, I think I think that situation, it's a tough situation, and I'm, I'm not an expert on it uh, beyond what I've read in the media. But, uh, you know, to me, it really underscores the, uh, the, the risks that you have around developing uh, mines in the world today. You know, in the, in the uh, situation of copper, we know that a lot of copper deposits around the world are located in some risky jurisdictions. And uh, investors, you know, see these situations like what's happened this week in Panama, and they price that in. Uh, to their returns, um, you know, when they're making investments and when, when they're making investment decisions. So it's going to make it, yeah, it's another another example. It's, as I said, a tough situation, but, uh, you know, it's going to make cost, uh, make capital more more expensive for the rest of us, for sure. Yeah, Cashel, I w same question to you on the cost of, of capital specifically as a result of First Quantum. I mean, $10 billion invested in that mine, um, and now it's all going to be shut down. Yeah, it, 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 it's very unfortunate. I think it, it's an emphasis on um, your license to operate. It, it's not simply getting the right to build a mine, it's holding on to that right. Um, some jurisdictions are, are, are stronger than others, and I think it comes in, the jurisdictional risk will come into the cost of capital, and that'll be the big portion. Uh, that we'll see uh, the big effect out of this is how strong is the jurisdiction you're in to reduce maybe that cost of capital or the availability of that capital. Your thoughts, Eugene, on first quantum? I think, I think it really just underscores um, how companies need to determine how to allocate capital and, and risk adjust those returns. Um, you know, for us at, at HUD Bay, it's, it's, it's um, the, we look beyond the economic and social impacts of, of a mine, and you have to understand, um, you know, the returns that you that you get from it, and what you what you bring back to the communities to ensure that, as Cashel mentioned, you get that social license. Um, different countries have have different risk profiles, and that's why there are different uh, discount rates that are applied to them. And I think uh, it really does underscore uh, the need to to look at uh, where you allocate capital and what returns uh, you, you you expect from them and, and adjust for them. Uh, before you allocate that capital. Okay, and we, sh we should talk a little bit. I'll, I'll give you each a chance to talk a bit about where you operate. In, in the case of HUD Bay, obviously Canada, the U.S., Peru. Correct. Um, so let's back up a little bit to earlier on in the chain. We have seen in Canada, certainly, the whole ecosystem change pretty dramatically in, in recent years. There just aren't as many juniors um, out there as there used to be. Eugene, how much of that do you think is lack of I guess, equity interest in the, in the space, or is there something else going on? Mining companies have to compete for capital just along with everyone else in the industry. And in the last few years, we've seen tech companies in, in Canada, cannabis companies, uh, steal a lot of the, the, the capital or, or uh, steal the, uh, uh, attract all the ca a lot of the capital that's uh, in the higher beta sort of uh, areas. And, and mining companies need to show a return uh, on that capital to, to kind of re-earn that trust and, and interest. And, and so it, it goes back to my earlier comment about uh, mining companies having to uh, allocate capital properly, generate returns, and, uh, and, uh, and, and earn the right to, to get that equity capital back. I think one of the things that we haven't seen is a lot of mind building. So it, for me, it's the ecosystem is, is you need to move, move things along. So if the large companies aren't building new mines, which they haven't recently, and 
um, the medium companies haven't haven't really uh, merged and 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 uh, and created the, the the desire for for, for junior companies. The, the, the next step down, the interest, the equity interest in, in, in projects and building mines and, and investing in, 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 in exploration has, has, hasn't been there. So I think it, it really has filtered down. And as we see uh, commodity prices sustainably increase, I think as companies generate strong returns, they're going to you know, redeploy that cap. They're going to have that license to redeploy that capital. And I think that's going to trickle down through the ecosystem and attract more capital to the juniors, the exploration companies, so that they can find new discoveries to, uh, for uh, for tomorrow's uh, uh, mine builds. Okay, there's a few thread threads there. I think we can we can pick away at um, Eugene and Stuart. I guess starting with who your competition is. I is it other miners now, or is it cannabis and crypto and whatever the new thing is? Well, yeah. Th I mean, there's definitely. I, I completely agree with Eugene. I mean, there's less capital um, available for for mining and junior junior mining specifically. Uh, I mean, uh, cannabis, AI, tech. You know, meme stocks. I mean, these are all all people where, where places where people are putting risk capital. But I would add another one uh, that, that you know, the, a trend we've seen over the last decade is a shift to passive investing. And uh, you know, it, it's you mean ETFs. ETFs, yeah. And you, you know, you can't um, meet with an ETF and and uh, you know promote your story. You can't uh, raise capital from an ETF. You're going to just follow the index. So that has changed the dynamic for sure. I mean, I know in, in my career, 15 years ago, you could go to Toronto or New York, you could eat, meet, endlessly meet with uh, mining specialist equity investors. It's, there's, there's a lot fewer of them around now um, on the equity side. And, even, and on the debt side, I think the market's changed as well for, for juniors. Um, project, you know, 15 years ago, we had a dozen or so banks uh, lending money to mining projects, project finance. Today, there's two or three. So it's, it's, it's a very challenging environment for junior, junior miners, for single asset companies. It's a, little more, it's a little easier for producers because you can deploy your, your, your cash flow from operations and, and, and invest that in your projects to move them forward, which is, which is what we've been doing at Tosico. But uh, to start a greenfield uh, project you know, as a junior is just, yeah, it's, it's, it was never easy, but it's, it's very challenging these days. And Cashel, same same question to you, and and I guess the one that I'd add to that is the extent to which um, you believe younger investors may also be kind of souring on extractive in industries. There's no doubt um, that younger investors probably have soured to it. It's what they're familiar with, you know. Um, it's what we introduce our young people to, or what narrative they hear in the media. Um, I think one of the new developments we're seeing when you connect it to the revolution of the EV world and uh, the greening of the environment, that connection eventually will have to be made that that's done through raw materials. Um, there's not enough recycling. It's going to be consumed. And we're going to have to do it from the primary source, which is mining or extractive metals. And so um, I think that's one of the narratives that I see changing um, bit by bit, that people are starting to understand that. I don't know how rapid or how quickly it'll come on. Um, but that narrative is really important for us as an industry um, to be part of, that we're part of the solution. Um, I think that's one of the things our industry has suffered from in the past, that we've always been embarrassed about what our um, vocation was and what we're doing. Um, and that um, there are very poor examples of practices in the past uh, that we need to overcome. And I think the industry has come a long way in safety. It's come a long way in ESG, and it's certainly come a long way in uh, environmental production. And so the standards that are there now are very, very robust, and the adherence to those standards and to that social license is key now for our younger generation to participate and understand that this is an honorable industry, and it's required for the, what they want in life. And has it come a long way in terms of fiscal discipline? Because I think obviously you know, one of the reasons that equity investors may be soured on the space is also the memory of the last super cycle, right? It, and there, what happened to a lot of companies. There, there's absolutely no doubt. And um, part of it comes down to experience, and it's also a human resource issue. Uh, to be able to execute on things, you need experience and you need uh, practice. And one of the things with our industry over the last uh, period of um, austerity is we've really hollowed out capability. And it's one of the things that's lacking. So we need to build that capacity again in the system. 
Uh, also with austerity, we've ignored the assets and we've, we've wanted them to produce at the same levels. But because we weren't reinvesting in them, they weren't capable of doing so. And that has really disappointed the investors. So it's about having that discipline mm. and that patience to be able to reinvest in the current older assets that will deliver it and that will provide the confidence for the new investment. Uh, yeah, please, Eugene. I was going to say, I think I agree with the uh, Cashel's comments. I think that the opportunity here is is uh, the changing lexicon. So the, the word critical minerals and, and, you know, and, and the, 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 the pause that people take, the young people take, to understanding what that really means. What is a critical material? Uh, what is, what, what, how does it help us? It, it, it's sort of moved beyond mining and just extractive. It's what well, we need these critical materials for the decarbonization, for, for the economy, that, 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 the electrification that, that, that we want in the future. And so I think that the, the changing lexicon allows people to, to take another hard look at this industry and say, we, yeah, we can invest this in, in this industry. It can be a clean industry if, if done properly with the right standards. And, and we need it because to move from, we'll call it the fossil fuel burn, burning world to, 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 to one that, uh, that, has, that creates less greenhouse gases for all of us, we need, to, we need, we need these minerals. And, and how do we extract these uh, most efficiently? And, and it needs capital to, 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 to start that. I think the, the, the toughest part about mining and extractive industry is, is the upfront capital. There's a, a very long period of, of permitting, a feasibility, yeah. and, 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 uh, and, and construction. Decades. Decades uh, of exploration before we, we can get, we can get you know, in, in, into the returns. It's a, um, it's a capital intensive industry that has as, that's cyclical and we need to sort of get back into it. And I think the critical minerals lexicon allows us to kind of move, move into this area. It probably is with not for the faint hearted. I mean, when I, when I covered mining, it was very striking to me the fact that you're dealing with such long timelines. You're dealing with completely unpredictable commodity prices, like so many things outside of your control. And now, like, obviously, the, the capital constraints. Um, so my next question is, where is the money going to come from? Um, if equity investors have soured on the space, if you're not getting the younger investors, I'll, this one for you, Stuart, but like again, you know, streaming royalty agreements were, were considered like one option. We've seen what happened to Franco Nevada this week, again, with the first quantum news. So yeah. like, how are you going to pay for this stuff? Yeah, no, you're right. It's, uh, that's, that's the big focus and the big challenge for our industry. It's a capital intensive business and it's about, you know, where, where are you going to, how are you going to build mines? Um, one, one thing that I think we've, we've been able to do at Tosico is partner where appropriate. Um, you know, we've, we've at, at our Gibraltar mine, we were able to partner with a Japanese consortium of, of investors, not investors, but actually smelters and end users of metal 10 years ago. Uh, more recently, we've been able to attract at our Florence project, uh, actually a different Japanese company, Mitsui, um, as a trader as well. Their interest uh, is offtake. And so, you know, I think partnering with end users yeah. Um, OEMs is another trend we see. We see the auto companies out there getting more active, looking at projects. Um, you know, I think those strategic investors, um, they're close to the demand. Like, they see the supply and the demand. They see the market dynamics. They're on the front lines of it. And so when you see those kind of companies investing in, in mines, I think that's a signal to all of us that, that hey, this is, this is important, this is, this, this, is, this is critical, and if we don't kind of secure our, our supply going forward, there's, there's going to be a challenge. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, th I mean, there have been a few interesting things lately. You, you know, like uh, you mentioned this one, but you know, Ford with um, the lithium company, like a few automakers have stepped in, yeah. joint ventures with Japanese partners. Um, Cashel, I mean, would you care to speculate on where you think most of the financing is going to come from in coming years? Yeah, I, I think they'd be backed by nations for low interest coming in, much like the Japanese model that Stuart said. We have a partner at our Mental Verde project that we're just completing the construction at, and it's a Mitsubishi Metals Corporation. Uh, they're a 30% owner. And we see some of our future growth being funded in a similar manner. But we've had um, OEMs like Ford and GM call us for direct metal, especially out of our cathode business. We have some byproducts in the future we're growing into, like cobalt, where we're getting direct interest from battery producers. Um, so I think that those are a lot of them. But there's some, um, there's some federal funding, both in Canada and the US, for example, the IRA in the US or the federal EDC, where they're becoming active um, 
in the due diligence space, looking at investing in minerals, knowing that um, they're probably behind the eight ball in competing for world resources against some of the other countries in the world. And so we see in Africa, it's been very much dominated by the Chinese in getting uh, these minerals. And we're starting to see um, the portfolios of these ministers in both the US and Canada becoming very active and coming up to speed on where the extractive industries are and where future metals might come from. That would seem to you know, create a potential divide, I guess, between what it takes to develop a critical mineral mine versus maybe what it takes to develop a gold mine nowadays. Um, Eugene, looking at Canada specifically, last year we saw Ottawa offering a 30% development tax credit on critical minerals but also preventing some Chinese miners from investing in lithium. Um, I guess my question is, is the role of government policy in all of this? I think government has, is, has a big role to play in incentivizing mining uh, mineral companies to, to build mines and, and, and to create jobs and uh, create economic wealth. Um, government has, has a history, and I actually talked about the IRA in the, in the United States, the Canadian government with, with investment tax credits, and, and the flow-through program, which is decades old uh, in Canada, has encouraged exploration, mineral exploration in northern Canada and, and, and uh, uh, for, for many years. So th those programs um, have sparked a lot of uh, discoveries, have sparked mines, and, and, and so in, in this way, the governments can participate uh, with this rebate on, on some of the, on the mining infrastructure for critical materials to to ensure that we do have a pipeline of, of, of projects and critical minerals coming out of, uh, out of North America that are critical to our supply chains as, as the world is, is, is in many ways deglobalizing, right? So um, having the, the, both the US and Canadian governments have, have recognized this, the, the importance of, of having sources of, poor sources of minerals and processing uh, uh, on, on, on shore. And uh, you know the the last few years, whether it's COVID or geopolitical politics, have only exacerbated those those concerns. And governments are are stepping up now to realize what they need to do to incentivize uh, and encourage uh, the the development of of uh, these uh, projects uh, on our lands. Stuart, you're in a kind of a unique position in that you can speak to the difference in terms of the approval processes and some of those government policies on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border. What yeah. what are you finding now? Yeah, I think, well, maybe just to follow up on the, on the funding and, and the government support for, for mining, and, and I think it applies in, in the U.S. and, and Canada. And, and it's really, I think there's a subtle, there's definitely funding available. I think the IRA is great. I think there's a subtle um, di difference there in, in what's being funded, particularly in the U.S., and it's processing. Um, of, of critical minerals and not direct mining extraction. Right. Um, and that's notable, I think. Um, you know, and it, go, and it goes to, to uh, Cashel's point earlier that, you know, it's really, we got to get the metals out of the ground, right? And everything around us is, you know, you either, it either came out of the ground or it was grown. So it's, it, it, the, the primary extraction is, is, in my view, the important piece. Uh, processing and, and refining, obviously, is, is helpful as well. But uh, if we want to kind of control our, our supply or our security of supply in, in, within the North American market, um, we gotta, we got to recognize that we need mines. So um, yeah, anyway. Uh, and to the other part of your question in terms of permitting and regulation, um, yeah, it's, you know, I think both Canada and the US, uh, they're, they're not easy places to permit new mines, right? And, uh, you know, we just spent 10 years in Arizona getting our, our permit for our Florence operation. Um, but you know, and it's similar, and it, it's a similar challenges in, in BC as well. You got to be, you got to be first class. You've got to be top notch in in all of your compliance, but uh, in your community relations. But uh, the, you know, the good news is once you're operating, these are very solid jurisdictions, and you're not going to have a, a Panama situation uh, when you've when you've built and when you, you're built and operating. Eugene, your um, your constant Constancia. Constancia project in Peru uh, moved forward quite quickly in mining terms. What, uh, what was it, do you think, about that jurisdiction that allowed that to happen? 
I think uh, it's, it's a strong history of, of, of mining. And so whether you know, other jurisdictions that had bays in, Canada, Peru, uh, the United States, have a strong history and culture of, of, of mining. Peru is the second largest uh, producer of copper. It's been the second largest producer of copper as a country for the last 10 years. It likely will be for the next 10 years going forward. And it's an important element, whether it's Canada, Peru, or the United States, that there's a strong um, sort of uh, culture and government experience with mines and how and, and, and the economic benefits it can bring to, to uh, remote areas. And the communities uh, help them develop uh, their people and, and uh, create eco economic wealth. And so uh, our experience is, is to essentially um, make sure that we localize the operations to the, so it is, it, it is a, uh, you know, our proven operation today has only one expat out of a thousand people working there. And so it's, it, it really is a Peruvian mine, not a, not a, not a, not a Canadian mine. It's a Peruvian mine with, you know, with some expertise provided globally. Uh, but, but there's really strong ownership there. And I think, you know, where, wherever you develop a mine, uh, we need, to, you, may, you need to make that, those connections with uh, the people, the government, uh, and to, to get the results that you need to ensure that you have the, the social license uh, and to, to, to operate and, and generate, um, create these minerals and generate economic wealth. I think a lot of people, you know, thought that the EV transition was going to be a game changer for copper. I, I guess I'm wondering, like, is there a price at which you need copper to hit for it to make sense to Cashel to, to build a new mine, to look for another project? Yeah, I guess we call it the in incentive pricing for copper. Um, what does it take for a company to want to, you know, raise the capital and put it at risk? And what is the transition doing to that price? Yeah, so I, I think presently there's sort of a disconnect maybe between the macro economy and the inflationary environment that we exist in that, you know, the, 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 the logical answer is, is that the developers and builders of the world aren't buying copper because it costs more to borrow money. But actually, <laughs> the opposite is quite true. Um, what we're seeing recently uh, within the market is, is we've had a big move in TCRCs. Those are the, 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 uh, the charges that um, a smelter will charge a mine-producing concentrate to incentivize the miners to sell their concentrate to them. And there's a bit of a, a price war going on there right now in the spot market. And it's showing that the supply isn't there, whether it's short term because of things like First Quantum or the sporadic production out of a big mine in Peru like Las Bombas. Um, we're seeing that there is that competition there and the, the supply isn't there and the demand is there. So I think there's a macro overshadowing of that, of where we are in, in the economy. Um, so that'll have to work its way out, you know, through this inflationary environment and with interest rates going back down, I think there'll be a big dearth in the amount of supply of copper because of the lack of building that has gone on over the last 10 years. So I think it'll be quite shocking when it does happen. Okay. okay, I'd like to, I'm going to end on that with e each of you, please. So you, you go, go yeah, first, I, I Eugene, just, but your thoughts on just, higher interest rates. And just, just adding inflation. on to that, the, I think the, the, the volatility in, in, in the global marketplace, whether it's interest rates or, or, or commodity prices, have, have not provided the right incentive price for, for, for new mine builds. I know for HUD Bay, early this year, we were, you know, we have a, a great project in Copper World in the United, United States, but we found it cheaper to buy than build. The cost of buying something today uh, with ready production uh, with our acquisition of Copper Mountain in, in, in BC would be cheaper than building a new mine today. And so until the prices are there to incentivize uh, and, and the uh, interest rates and cost of capital are there to incentivize new mine builds, you won't see it. We've seen copper above $3 for the last three years, but no green lighting of, of mines. And so the so three dollars isn't enough. Three dollars so, isn't so, enough. So what is it? What's the number? I think you know, I think it's probably north of four because you know we've been we've been sitting at this three seventy five environment and still with these rates that's that's it's it's very clear that the to generate a, a risk adjusted return is going back to the kind of the first question above our uh, cost of capital for for margin the right margin for uh, miners and investors uh, we certainly need you know it's greater than fifteen twenty percent returns uh, above four dollars copper. Stuart, uh, my view, yeah, I, I in, if you ask about incentive price, I think. You got it, yeah, the financial returns is one aspect, but going back to other constraints, you know, even if you have uh, $5 copper prices, if you gotta wait five years to get your permit, you can't capitalize on that. 
if you don't have the human resources, you know, the management capacity, which, which we talked about. Um, so there's, yes, uh, incentive price will be helpful, but I don't think it's the only constraint holding back supply. So anyway, needless to say, I'm very bullish on copper. So. All right, well, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. We have one second to spare, so well-timed, and yeah. uh, thank you very much. Thank you.